Joining me on the telephone is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, New York Times reporter and PBS frontline host and producer, Hedrick Smith. Mr. Smith will be talking about his latest book, Who Stole the American Dream? An analysis of the growing gap in income and wealth in the United States at two events on Whidbey Island. He speaks Friday night at 7 p.m. at the Whidbey Island Center for the Arts in Langley and then again Saturday night also at 7 at Coopville High School. His presentation is part of the Trudy Sundberg Lecture Series, which honors an Oak Harbor teacher who passed away in 2013. In 1971, as the Times' chief diplomatic correspondent, Mr. Smith was a member of the team which produced the Pentagon Paper Series. And in 1974, he was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for his coverage of the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe. Mr. Smith, thank you for taking some time to speak with us. I know it is late. On the no, East it's, Coast. My, it's my pleasure, Ed. I'm really looking forward to, be, uh, to being with you on Whidbey. You didn't mention it, but one of uh, our great pleasures is to spend our summers on Orcas Island. So we uh, we know Whidbey, we know Orcas, we know the San Juans and the whole Seattle area, so it will be a real pleasure to be out there again with you good people and to see that, uh, that area uh, later this week before we come out for our summer visit. I envy you. I love Orcas Island. It's, it's a great, great place. Been there yeah. many, many times. Yeah. Um, in your book, you make a very strong case that the dismantling of the American dream began or at least got its first critical hearing with the so-called Powell Memo, written by Lewis Franklin Powell, Jr., uh, a confidential memorandum, memorandum to the U.S. Chamber of, Cor of Commerce that became more or less a guidebook for... Uh, the concept of unregulated or maybe minimally regulated capitalism. Uh, is that too, is that accurate or is that too Yeah, simplistic? that's accurate. In fact, you can go further than that. It, it was a real, he's a real Paul Revere. It was a corporate manifesto. And he was going way beyond the idea of unregulated capitalism. Uh, what he was doing was he was saying to the corporate chiefs of America, uh, through his friends at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce who circulated his memo privately, you're being taken to the cleaners by trade unions, by the women's movement, by the civil rights movement, by the consumer movement, by the environmental movement. All these mass movements, which in the 1960s had had a real impact on governmental policy. Uh, obviously, in, in the, our part of the world out there in the Pacific Northwest, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act had, had enormous uh, impact. But but so did the Ralph Nader and the consumers movement. So did the women's movement pushing to change the situation where women were making only 41 cents on the dollar for doing the same work as men. So what Powell was saying to the corporate leaders is you got to get organized. You got to get to Washington. You got to take the high ground. You got to, you got to play hardball politics against all these different movements. And he specifically mentions uh, the ones that I ticked off for you by name, uh, you know. Uh, the women's movement and Ralph Nader and uh, I think he, he regarded Walter Ruther as a, uh, the head of the United Auto Workers Union as a greater danger to American free enterprise and capitalism than Soviet communism. I mean, so he had a, he had a real bear uh, going there. And and what was amazing was that this memo that he wrote, which I think is one of the most important neglected documents of American history of the past 50 years, uh, and I got the publisher, by the way, to print it, the full text of it, in my book. Um, uh, what he was really trying to do was to, to exercise, get, get, get a change in the power balance in Washington, and it had an immediate impact. The Business Roundtable, which is now the, the leaders of a couple hundred of the CEOs of the biggest corporations in America, probably the most influential political voice of corporate America didn't exist. It was formed four months after uh, the Powell Memo was circulated. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, doubled its staff, tripled its its budget. Uh, the U.S. Federation of Independent Businesses, the arm of small business, went from 3,000 members to 600,000 in eight years. The National Association of Manufacturing moved its home office from Chicago to, to Washington. Uh, the number of corporate lobbyists there were by 1980, before Ronald Reagan was elected, uh, was up to about 9,000. There were 50,000 people working for business trade associations, you know, writers, advertisers, monthly newsletters, organizers. I mean, there was what I call Powell's Army, and it had a tremendous impact on policy. Uh, they became the most powerful lobbying force, and they still are, by the way, the most powerful lobbying force in America. That is when 
the landscape of power in America changed. It actually began changing before Reagan was elected, contrary to what I and a lot of other journalists and a lot of other people thought. It actually began under Jimmy Carter with the Democrats in the, uh, control of both houses of Congress. I mean, it was a hell of an, uh, a discovery for me. I ran the Washington Bureau of the New York Times back in the late 70s. We saw some of the symptoms. We really didn't know the cause. We knew nothing about the Powell Memo. Nobody knew anything about it at all. Uh, I can remember giving a talk um, in Washington when my book, Who Stole the American Dream, came out in 2012, September 2012. Forty or fifty of the leading Washington journalists at the home of, of uh, my friend Mark Shields, who writes for the Washington Post. Jim Blair was there from PBS, uh, all kinds of people, uh, from uh, uh, Bob Schieffer, from, who was then running Face the Nation. None of them had ever heard of the Powell Memo. And then I talk on 30 years, 40 years after it happened. Uh, terrific impact from that thing and yeah then we start to see the whole political and economic scenario unfold and, and a radical change really coming about in the distribution of power and the distribution of wealth and economic income in this country and, and capitalism prior to that operated very differently from the way it does today and it is set in, in motion a cascade of events that, that led to the current downsizing offshoring uh, cost-cutting expenses uh, to the health and safety of, of of the worker, who was Lois Franklin Powell to be able to write a memo that had such a dramatic impact? Certainly, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was not sitting on its hands. No, uh, I, I, well, Powell was a Powell was a guy with great insight, uh, and he wrote well and he wrote persuasively. But I don't think it was the influence of Powell. I think that that. Uh, Powell clearly was a clarion voice, a Paul Revere, but but what he wrote fell on on very fertile ground. There was enormous frustration uh, among the business leadership. It had begun with Barry Goldwater's campaign in 1964, so that's seven years before. Um, then you know, set back by Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society, and ironically. The highly regulatory presidency of Richard Nixon, Republican pro-business president. He's the guy who set up the EPA, set up OSHA, set up a whole lot of regulatory bodies. By the time Powell wrote his memo, business leaders were sick of hearing from the women, from the consumers, from the blacks, from the environmentalists, from the trade unions, and from the regulations of the government. So when Powell wrote this thing, it just was a, like an echo chamber. The business leaders just responded. I, mean, I remember talking to guys I knew myself, Irving Shapiro ran DuPont, and, and uh, Reg Jones, who ran General Electric. They, they, were, they were resentful. They felt as though business had been politically marginalized. And so it was really their attitudes that made cause such an echo chamber for, for what Powell wrote. But Powell articulated it. And he said it, and he said it very forcefully. And he didn't. And, and what he said also to business was, you got to stop fighting among themselves. You know, one company fighting against another, one sector fighting against another. You got to realize that for business, the real threat is coming from consumers, from labor, from women, from environmentalists, from greenies, and from these other groups. So band together, make a long-term plan, start putting money into politics. That it's 1974 that you begin to see a real growth in the political action committees on the corporate side. Before that, it was that was largely a human union phenomenon. But after 1974, 75, there was a ruling by the Federal Election Commission that allowed corporations to do that. And you begin to see corporate spending in campaigns and then corporate spending and lobbying just begin to skyrocket. And today, uh, most people still think of organized labor and, and business as being roughly on a par. Uh, business outspends labor lobbying in Washington 60 to 1. 60 to 1, not 6 to 1, 60 to 1. Outspends consumers probably 100 to 1. Environmentalists probably 100 to 1. And on the campaign trail, probably outspend uh, business outspends uh, labor 15 to 1. Hard money, soft money, probably 90 to 1. I just saw some figures on super PAC donations this year. They're already running double what they were in 2012 at this stage of the campaign. Seventy percent of the money has come from conservatives or, or business interests, 30 percent on the progressive uh, liberal labor side. So there's still a heavy, heavy tilt uh, that, that got really got moved by this Powell memo and what followed from that. And, and did you run across any evidence that President Nixon knew of this memo prior to his appointment of uh, Mr. Powell to the Supreme Court? None whatsoever. It does not appear, I don't, I don't know why, 
it doesn't appear as though Nixon uh, was aware of it. Nixon tapped Powell. Powell doesn't get approved to the Supreme Court by the Senate until 2002. But Nixon tapped Powell for the job uh, on the Supreme Court within about two or three months of Powell's writing this memo. Powell wrote the memo in August of 1971. Nixon uh, tapped him in November. So it was very quickly after that. The Powell memo hadn't circulated that widely. Um, only among the group in the business roundtable, this top IBM, General Electric, General Motors, DuPont, very, very big company CEOs, it began to, to percolate. And then you know, Powell's already on the Supreme Court by the time it really starts to get moving. Because he played a, a key role in Citizens United and, and the, the super PACs, did he not? Yeah, there's, there's no question that Powell... Powell's an interesting character on the court, and you've got me in an area where I'm, I'm not an expert, which is, uh, which is judicial history. My specialty is political history and uh, some economic history, certainly covering the campaigns and the administrations. But it is pretty well established at this point that in the period since Powell was appointed, and well, you can't say he was the watershed, he turned it all around. But in the, Powell since, uh, in the time since Powell's reported, there's no question that the court has weighted very heavily in favor of corporations against consumers, against laborers, uh, against uh, individuals who have complaints against companies. I don't mean that all the rulings have gone that way, certainly not, but, but the majority, you know, when there's a clash over property rights, uh, rights of corporations, the corporations are now claiming First Amendment rights to say and do all kinds of things. So the court's been very, very favorable. But Powell, on other issues, you know, on the issue of desegregation and other issues, Powell was often a man who helped put consensus together on the court. But on these economic issues, he tilted very clearly, very strongly in favor of business and against any interest that hemmed in, in his view, um, the freedom of the CEO to do practically whatever he wanted to do. And, and did you see any evidence that President Reagan was aware of the, the memo? Because he almost took that as a playbook for his presidency with... Well, you know, I, the way Reagan, I, and I covered Reagan very closely and knew a lot of the people in Reagan's White House, I, 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 I would guess that, uh, though I didn't know it at the time, I would guess that Deaver and Baker and uh, Ed Meese, people around uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, knew about Powell's memo and its influence, but they would not have necessarily briefed Reagan specifically on the memo. You know, Reagan in his own thinking at that point was already there. I, I don't I don't think that Reagan had to be moved. I mean, you know, he'd served two terms as governor of California. He'd formed his political philosophy, his political strategy. He'd shifted from being a Roosevelt Democrat to being, a, you know, a Barry Goldwater kind of Republican. He made a famous speech, fam the last speech in favor of Goldwater on national television in 1964 was made by Ronald Reagan. So Reagan, Reagan was at that viewpoint and at that political position. Position seven years before Powell wrote his memo, so I, I don't think that his his uh, lieutenants and acolytes would have said, "Hey, you got to read this memo." And in your book, do you come to the conclusion that we've passed a tipping point as you look at NAFTA and the TPP and Citizens United? Have have we passed that tipping point of uh, of wealth? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think this year's campaign is in some ways encouraging that respect. I'm, I'm sitting here while, while you're uh, talking to me, writing a, a, an op-ed or a blog in which I'm saying that the campaign of this year has changed the normal left-right, Republican, Democrat, conservative, uh, liberal axis of the campaign and made it now bottom up. It's populism versus elitism. It's the 99% versus the 1%. It's small donors versus super PACs. And certainly the trade agreements that you just referred to, NAFTA, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that uh, Obama wants to try to get passed, uh, and the record with Korea and other uh, Central American uh, trade agreements is a key issue. I mean, Donald Trump has made that central to his campaign. Bernie Sanders has used it to lambaste uh, Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. Uh, these issues are now out in the open. I think the, the real cleavage in America, which is up down in many ways rather than side to side, rather left to right, it's more bottom up uh, kind of a mutiny. I think that could begin to change the politics, but it's not going to change the politics in the Congress until we fix the political system, until we fix gerrymandering, fix dark money in politics, the influence of big money, uh, roll back Citizens United. Uh, it's very difficult to 
turn this Congress around. No matter who gets elected president, we're all focused on the presidency right now because of the nomination battle in both parties. But uh, but Congress is a pretty stand pat institution, and uh, the the not so much the Senate, but certainly in the House, uh, you know, 85, 90 percent of the seats are pretty well fixed by gerrymandering. It, it's a serious, serious problem. Um, that's something I want to talk to people about out there. Washington State's done better on that score than almost any state in the country with the top two nonpartisan primary. And we've got a sort you know, we have a sort of independent uh, bipartisan commission that does the gerrymandering. There's still there's still district swapping that goes on between Republicans and Democrats. It could be a bit better in Washington state, but it's a heck of a lot better than in a lot of states. I mean, you would not believe the political arithmetic in some of the states, and mostly done by Republicans because they've been smarter about it than Democrats. But Democrats do it, too. Both parties are guilty, and, and uh, it's, it's absolutely destroying our democracy, and it's creating a gridlock that keeps us from dealing with the kind of issue you raised, whether it's trade agreements, climate change, immigration reform, education, you name it, we can't get there. The status quo gets defended by a stand-packed Congress, Congress, which is protected by gerrymandering. Well, as, as I understand it, there's already a group, uh, as uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, possibilities ebb, uh, that, that are looking at 2018. So the question is, and I know that you've got, you're short on time, can, can the focus survive the cult of uh, Senator Sanders' personality? Well, I would put the question in a different way, but you've got a good question there. The question is really, can you, can smart people, including Senator Sanders himself, translate the passion, the energy, the commitment, the direction, the focus, the issues that he has brought front and center into an effective uh, democracy movement in this country? that will mirror the sort of the history of the early 20th century when we had the progressive movement and we got the women's vote, direct election of senators, income tax amendment, a whole lot of other, and trust busting by, by Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, we could be uh, on the verge of moving into that kind of an era, but a lot of it will depend on um, how the Democratic Party goes, who wins the presidency, but even more important, whether or not there is a strong um, democracy, small d. I'm not talking about the Democratic Party. I'm talking about fixing uh, democracy in our country, fixing the system that most people believe is broken and is in the hands of special interests. That's a really, that's a really critical question, and that'll be a major topic that I'm going to be talking about uh, on, on Whidbey Island. I hope we get in a lot of good dialogue about it. I've got some ideas. I've got a website, reclaimtheamericandream.org. That's reclaimtheamericandream.org. You can go there. See what's going on on gerrymandering, what's going on on dark money, what's going on on, on um, amending the Constitution, stuff that's going on in Washington State and all across the country. There are maps, all kinds of information. So I hope people will go there. I'm eager to talk about that stuff. This is really important. Mr. Smith, I know your time is limited, and I thank you for taking uh, some time to talk with us this afternoon. Real pleasure to be with you. I look forward to being actually on the island in just a couple of days. Great. Thank you very much. All the best. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, author, New York Times reporter, Pedrick Smith. He will be talking about his latest book, Who Stole the American Dream? An analysis of the growing gap in income and wealth at two events on Whidbey Island. He speaks Friday night at 7 p.m. at the Whidbey Island Center for the Arts in Langley. And then again on Saturday night, also at 7 p.m. at Coopville High School. His presentation part of the Trudy Sundberg lecture series and if you want more information about that you can contact us here at KSER our phone number 425-303-9070